there are many time periods in our history that change societies and how we understood the world around us. One such period is the 19th century where, in a span of a century or even a lifetime, changed our way of life, how we understood the world, conducted trade, and organized war. Games depicted in this time period are few and far between since the complexity of 19th century world is both wide and deep. There are games that nail the societal transition and start of globalization really well. One of them is Anno 1800, a city builder real-time strategy game developed by Blue Byte and published by Ubisoft. As the latest and the culmination of all Anno gameplay, players are tasked to settle islands, build cities, set up production chains and logistic networks, and protect these routes and islands against enemy competitors. With the setting in the 19th century, hence the name, the themes of industrialization, discovery, and the increasing sophistication of production lines and needs are the core of the game. The recordings presented in this game are modded and is not reflective of the actual vanilla gameplay. This video is more of a discussion on the game's topics and certain mechanics rather than an actual playthrough session of the game. The modded gameplay is to accelerate the progress of the game to be able to present the necessary mechanics and storylines within the limited amount of time. The outline of this video is provided on the screen to guide you through the different chapters that we will discuss. Welcome to Game Analysis in Anno 1800. Being a city builder game, you are tasked to create cities and providing your residents with their needs, both in public service buildings and goods. You start out with simple production chains and needs from your farmers. Upon settling down workers, you will get more complex needs and production lines. In the old world, the highest tier residences, investors, has complex needs with factories having different production times that you can optimize to have a perfect production ratio but will continually need a lot of resources to maintain. This is your main concern, maintaining a factory-based economy while sustaining your citizens' needs. Certain islands only have certain number of fertilities and mining areas, and you will be forced to settle another island. This is where the colonial trade and logistic networks fall in. You have to use ships and trade routes to transport goods from one port to another. These islands will need people that you have to provide goods to provide you with manpower to work on the island's factories, mines, quarries, farms, and fields. From these mechanics, you can have different strategies. Will you transport goods from your main island to those islands for your population? Will you build your own small village with small production chain for your citizens' needs before building your new farms and factories? Or will you use a commuter pier that is convenient and expensive to share the island's manpower? All of these considerations for you as a player to choose. In terms of difficulty, you can customize it to your own liking. It could be an easy sandbox where you can experiment with economy building and beauty building, which is a gameplay where you make eye-catching city rather than just optimizing. You can have some bit of difficulty by adding competitors that will settle islands as well. You can also test your limits by having the most difficult settings to push your strategies optimizations, and management of cities down to the dot. This game will drain you hours of hours of your time, and I mean hours. You can just have a new save game if you don't feel like your save is not to your liking. The game's main driving force is the economy system. You will build farms, fields, and mines to gather raw and agricultural resources that will be processed into intermediate and eventually construction or consumer goods. Consumer goods are used by your island's population which increases based on the number of citizens in that island. Farmers have simple needs and simple production chains as mentioned, but also you can provide luxury needs which increases your population's happiness and income you get from them. For example, in order to get timber, a construction material, you have to have a lumberjack's hut which produces wood which is then processed in the sawmill to produce timber. Both produce one good every 15 seconds. Having a 1 to 1 ratio, one lumberjack's hut can sustain one sawmill. These ratios will be important if you want to optimize your production to minimize costs. 
One of the interesting production lines is the bread production line. A grain farm produces one grain every one minute. A flour mill requires one grain every 30 seconds to produce one flour. A bakery requires one flour every one minute to produce one bread. If we want to maintain a consistent ratio per unit time, we have to have two grain farms, so it produces one grain every 30 seconds, which is two grain every one minute is one grain every 30 seconds, one mill, and two bakeries, which is two flour every minute is one flour every 30 seconds used. We now have a two grain farm is to one flour mill to two bakeries ratio. This just assumes that you do not have modifiers like production increase or specialists. There are guides online in order to fit an entire goods production line in one area or mix them up also with other goods. This makes the production line put into one area and also minimizes travel time of carts to pick up those goods into the warehouses. Or you can do a mix of planned production goods and separate factories where raw and agricultural resources are on one part of your island while the factories are on the other, often near your main warehouse. These strategies are available for you to plan out as long as you are able to provide to your population's needs and also minimizing costs so that you don't go bankrupt. Along with the economic aspect of factories, you also have to plan out your city because they also need public service buildings. This is the first thing you will build in any city, in any settlement, in any region to get your population going. Eventually, you will need larger spaces for these public service buildings, but they have a larger radius to provide for larger population sizes. In terms of the game, this gives your city a form of a city center where your most important public service buildings are located. It makes the game more pleasing to the eyes rather than just dotting your island with houses. Or you can go with spontaneous building as you go and see how your city will work out based on this kind of building. The game revolves around the use of production lines and configuration of the economy into manufactories. The production of goods from raw resources to manufactured goods is not new to this era, but the decline of locally produced goods in favor of mass production is the main economic aspect of the industrialization and consequently what we know of about the industrial era. In the early parts of our history's industrialization, population are centralized into cities which becomes the workforce for the factories. Raw resources are still getting gathered from farming villages, mining districts, fishing villages, and forests, but all of them are delivered to the cities, either raw or processed, to be manufactured in cities. The game masks this concept by using warehouses. These warehouses act as magical boxes where once a resource is dropped there, it is accessible anywhere else in the island. This means that you can separate your farms to your factories and even to your population. Your population will somehow go to the farms and factories they are working without considering how far they are. They just magically work there and go back to their residences. In the game, housing your residences increases the workforce available in the island which fill in to work to your farms and factories. In the game, you can go for just having enough people to break even on your workforce needed. And this game is not meant to be realistic, of course, as long as the game mechanics work well with the intended historical inspiration and their unique take on it to be enjoyable. Starting in the artisan tier in the old world, you will get your new world resource requirement for the needs of artisans, fur coats and rum. Fur coats require fur from the old world and cotton from the new world. Rum is a luxury resource produced exclusively in the New World. You have to create trade routes to provide the resources gathered from the New World back to the Old World. This is the colonial aspect of the game, where you settle islands to get their raw or manufactured resource and agricultural products to be shipped back to your home islands and produce other goods there. You can provide some of your population's needs on the islands by locally producing their needs or importing them from your main island through trade routes. This can happen in the old world too, where you settle other islands to get resources which your main island does not currently possess. In terms of optimization and ease of play, it's easier to have one main island where most of your population are centered, then deliver all the population's needs to that island, whether for further processing or finished goods already. In our history, a colonial economy only introduces the goods from a faraway land to the home market. 
industrialization ramps it up by having these goods produced in larger scales for mass production. Though this kind of acquisition of land seems to herald imperialism than just plain colonialism. Since there are no people living on these regions, it's just right to own these islands and exploit its resources for population and for your population's needs, right? On this part, we discuss the next mechanic that changes your economic capacity, electricity. Once you reach the engineer level and getting a power plant to provide electricity to your population and factories, you will have an economic spike where most of your factories will have a 100% increase in production rate within the coverage of the power plant. For example, a clay pit that produces one clay every 30 seconds will have their production boosted by 100%, making them produce two clay every 30 seconds. This increases your factory output but not your farms and fields. Mines and quarries will benefit from this electricity boost, but increased production of factories means increased consumption of needed goods as well. This is where you will double your animal farms and agricultural fields, but also means you do not need much factories to sustain your population's needs. If you are working with perfect ratios, as mentioned before, this will throw off those ratios since your factories will produce twice more goods per minute, requiring you to double the fields and animal farms you have. This change in the production line mirrors the real-life changes where factories, powered by steam engines and eventually electricity, ramp up the production of goods. This demanded more goods coming from the market. Eventually, many nations of the world, driven by this economic boom, settled and conquered new lands in Asia and Africa for more natural resources, land, and market to sell these goods. Here we discuss the social classes presented in the game. The old world has five residential tiers, farmers, workers, artisans, engineers, and investors. The first four contribute to the workforce while the last one, the investor, does not. This shows a hierarchy of people in terms of wealth and needs. Transitions from each residential tier is reflected by having the previous tier's needs, still a need for the next one and adding new ones. For example, artisans will require sausages, bread, soap, school and church and beer from the workers' needs, but does not need the farmer's need for marketplace fish, work clothes, pub and snaps. In the new world, you have jornaleros and obreros, just two tiers which show their role in the game, a supporting class for the old world's extravagance and needs. On this note, every region's residents always have women represented. Farmers and engineers in the old world, obreras in the new world, explorers in the arctic, and elders in Enbesa. The game does not hide the fact that women had an important role in this time period. I am personally happy that at least engineers are represented by a woman, which shows their contribution to this era's technological advancement and role in transitioning society into a more egalitarian one. When you just started playing Anno 1800, it is recommended that you play the campaign first with more guidance to familiarize yourself with the game. It is a tutorial campaign that gets your hands on how to build up your settlements. Being a campaign, it has a story that you'll follow to progress. You start off with a dialogue with your companion Arhan about a letter from your sister. You pay your passage to the old world via dynamite fishing, which teaches you the basic of combats and usables. You will be taught how to use your ship and what things you can do with it. This is helpful for your future quest and the foundation for completing quests and tasks in the campaign and in your sandbox gameplay. As you travel from the new world back to the old world to help your sister, trying to resolve the issue with your father being accused of treason, you are introduced to Bright Sands, your father's former city, now claimed by your uncle Edward. With the last of your sister's funds, Hannah Good, you acquire Ditchwater, an island near Bright Sands to build and try to clear your father's name. You build up your first village, clearing debris, and housing your farmers. You get introduced to building factories, farms, and production lines to provide to your farmers and expanding your small settlement. I, am so relieved on a I would like to point out, in terms of story and world building, that you are establishing a new company, and it seems that establishing one is surprisingly easy. Have fundings to settle islands and house people, 
have ships to transport goods and pay royal taxes to the empire. This is never thoroughly explained in the game as to how free companies like Good and Sons get established, but such is your role in the game. The culture that you are in has deep naval traditions that having the shipyards and lots of ships is a testament to your company's prestige and wealth. Trying to find out your father's death and the truth about the sale of prosperity lands you to go to the new world. After resolving each cases, helping Isabel Sarmento, you go back to the old world to confront your uncle Edward who was in charge of the sale for the prosperity, not your father's. Eventually, before Yans will came who bring their ships to attack your harbor, your NPC ships will also defend your harbor, and once you destroyed all the ships and their battle cruiser, the battle will be over, and the campaign marks its end. You give your father a proper burial, and the queen cleared his name. Paying his respects to your late father, the world is now safe, you are awarded the scorched bright sands back, everyone is happy, the Tiforians are gone, and you continue your journey as one of the leaders of Good and Sons, with now the queen recognizing your efforts to protect the empire. There are two DLCs that I want to tackle that discusses the old world's increasing demands and complex systems, Tourist Season and The High Life. These two DLCs are what I will say as the needlessly extravagant depictions of tourism, extravagance, and wealth of your settlement. These DLCs append to your existing gameplay by adding new buildings and production lines, two new mechanics introduced to you, public production buildings and multi-factories. You will now have public service buildings that require resources for them to provide to their citizens instead of providing them head-on by just placing them on your city. This means that you will have a mix of warehouse buildings with your cities, if you are a kind of player who separates your farms, fields, and factories from the main population hub. This increases the complexity of your city since you have to put these new public service buildings either around your city or in a city center to minimize maintenance costs. Multi-factories allow you to customize the recipes produced by these buildings depending on your needs. This flexibility allows you to change production for a while when you need a certain good in surplus without building a new factory building for that good. Let us start with tourist season. After attracting 500 engineers, which the settlement is considered as a capital, in any of the old world settlement, a tourist NPC will introduce herself. She is Emma. A holiday maker if you will. You are given a prompt whether to accept the tutorial on the tourism mechanics of the game. Your public mooring can now be upgraded to a tourist mooring, which is the starting point for all things tourists. You will be introduced to a new residential type with their assortment of needs. However, tourist spots require to be in a radius of a bus station, and these stations have radius on how far they will connect to the other bus stations. With the tourist mooring at the start, bus networks are connected together in the city, connecting variety theaters, restaurants, bars, cafes, museums, and other hotspots. The hotel is where your tourist residence will stay, and it has a huge capacity, and I mean huge. From here, you provide your goods automatically taken from the island storage, just like any other residences and public service needs must be within the radius of a bus station instead of near them directly. A new public service building that takes in goods to provide their needs, food and drink venues, will be introduced to you. These buildings provide the public service needs of tourists but takes in resources in order to provide that public service need. There are three buildings under this, restaurant, cafe, and bar. Surprisingly, these buildings require tourists as their workforce. It also provides bonuses to the radius around them depending on the recipe they are using. Yes, your restaurants can serve any of the recipes presented here as long as you have them unlocked and the ingredients for it. The mixed use of restaurants provide interesting building strategies in the city, putting these venues in the middle of residential areas to maximize their bonuses. Certain recipes are more beneficial to certain residential types to which you must be wary of. With these bonuses, consumption of these goods for those residences are reduced, reducing the strain in your production lines as well. A new multi-factory, orchards, will be introduced as well. It is a building that uses an area around them for resource just like lumberjack's huts. 
they can customize what they can produce. On another multifactory, a chemical plant becomes available to you which produces more of the tourists' needs like shampoo, lemonade, and souvenirs. It functions as a regular factory to which you can provide goods and the output the recipe's goods. I am not kidding when these are extravagant. Imagine having shampoo as your need during that time. With enough tourists, the queen commissions you to build an iron tower, a tall monument that serves as a food and drink venue as well. It introduces some social class interactions with the workers plotting to assassinate the queen during the inauguration of the tower. Once completed, this restaurant has unique recipes that has a large and compassing radius which can be increased or decreased by the number of tourists there. It may seem like the Eiffel Tower but it's actually inspired from Watkins Tower, an iron lattice tower in England. This iron tower has a description that just screams luxury. Culinary excellence set atop engineering excellence, the pinnacle of the empire's legacy. Table reservation run months long and dishes comprise some of the most exotic ingredients known to humankind. This new system increases the complexity of your economy with new needs and production lines, requiring new inputs and outputs for your tourist needs. What does tourists give you? Money. Boatloads of money. Money that you will not know where to spend. Tourists are literal walking gold that, though the resources needed to satisfy them can be expensive at first, the returns are enormous. An interesting thing about Emma the tourist, she is down bad. I mean, she fancies herself with the chef that she encountered on the cruise ship. In her words, I'll confess, I fantasized a chance meeting in the dancing hall once or twice, but in vain, alas. I mean, it's already in her personality to explore the world. It does not hurt to have romance to spice it up. A part of me speaks that there's a notion in tourism where you find your soon-to-be partner in these distant lands on a chance encounter as a tourist. A case of romanticism that is also prevalent during that time, I must say. Now, on to the next DLC, The High Life. Remember when I said that the investors are the highest residential tier in the old world? Upon reaching 5,000 investors, a businessman introduces himself to you about redefining the skyline. Donald Bader asks you to build skyscrapers and their amenities in your city, prompting you to the tutorial on building cities with skyscrapers in them. Investors are still the highest residential tier, but you can now upgrade these residences along with the engineer residences to be skyscrapers. Similar to the tourist season, you are introduced to new buildings, shopping arcades, assembly lines, and artisan workshops, along with other needs as well. Engineers can have a maximum of 3 levels, while investors have a maximum of 5, each level introducing a new need or two. Shopping arcades have 3 different buildings, unlocked at investors level 1, 3, and 5 respectively. Department store, furniture store, and drug store. They require artisans as their workforce. They are a mixed production and public service building like the food and drink venues in the tourist season in terms of mechanics and behavior. Now it caters to skyscraper needs. However, they only need to be within the street range of the residences instead of bus stations. They do provide bonuses in their radius though, reducing consumption of certain goods given certain patents. Your first department store patent, toasters, reduces jewelry consumption by 10% and light bulbs by 15%. This can greatly ease down your production lines if it's strained already. Assembly lines function like chemical plants, only more factory-like. Your first assembly line is the elevator patent which will be your new construction material that will be the basis for your skyscraper buildings and upgrades. Now you have 6 construction materials to work with in the old world. Timber, bricks, steel beams, glass windows, reinforced concrete, and elevators. This can allude to what the modern cities are made of before the advent of plastics and other synthetic materials we use for our residences now. Of course, this comes in a storyline. Donald Bader introduces himself as the swale investor that should be known for his idea of skyscrapers, shopping arcades, and increased consumerism. As you progress, you will encounter a new figure, Theodora, being called Miss Jenny by Donnie, an engineer with different roles under Donnie. 
There is a tone of resentment at Theodora's dialogues whenever there is an interaction between her and Donnie. Going through the quests, Donnie receives warning messages and tarot cards and some small sabotage happenings in his company. He treated it as a minor nuisance but eventually asks you to tell Theodora due to a discrepancy in finances on the sales of toothpaste in the drugstores. This is one of the hot topics during that time, participation of women in society in general, even in businesses. You have the option to help her out by bringing certain materials to your settlement. From there, a new patent, the lipstick, is born. This is a drugstore patent which you can produce. Aside from other catch the thief moments, the culmination of this social class interaction is the building of the Skyline Tower. A monument once you reach a certain amount of investor level 5 skyscrapers, the Skyline Tower will be available to you. This is the tallest building thus far in the game. This houses a lot of investors as well as getting bonus residences depending on the shopping arcades present in your island. As you upgrade your skyscrapers to higher levels, more complex needs with large production lines are asked for you. The largest so far, toys, require four steps from raw resources to intermediate goods to final product. Those resources have different ratios, mind you, and most of them come from a different region too. Look at that! Comparing it to the farmers which only need wool to create work clothes. Such complexity, such lavishness of a lifestyle it must have been to have these things produced for you. Being the tallest building ever built, there are considerations for its building. From ensuring that the workers are working, stolen construction materials, ensuring the building is safe by inspections, among other considerations. Donnie will be condescending to you when you pick the good options. This will delay the construction of the Skyline Tower for a time, which can be detrimental if you are aiming for the Gold Performance Medal, which requires you to build the tower in 2 hours game time or less. Eventually, this debacle will culminate with the setup of Theodora to make Donnie concede to the demands to make the tower safe. With you providing the last of materials to stabilize the tower, the construction continues and upon completion, the tower stands tall ready to be filled in by the investors. This building can fill in up to 4,000 investors with the base at 2,500 investors. The remaining 1,500 are filled in by providing the city with each patent from the three different shopping arcades. The storyline ends with a post-mortem, dedicating the tower based on your selection. I managed to get the egalitarian route which get you all the good bonuses. This quest line hits home because this is the culmination of 19th century class conflicts. Investors and capitalists being the new upper class other than nobles, driven by business and economic needs, commanding intellectuals and workers to do their bidding. This questline is what I can say where Anno 1800 peaked in showing how the class conflicts arose, even to this day. Though toned down for playability, it shows that class conflict is very much alive and an ongoing topic during this time period. Sadly, I have not read any literature that might have the storyline of a rich man and their female assistant with a female assistant sabotaging the business to push for more progressive changes in the company and society. But again, a female figure taking center stage to have their demands met for equality in society is such an impressive storyline to work with. The game presents a transition of society from an agricultural to an industrial and eventual modern society. This transition due to colonization, industrialization, and consumerism harkens how our history in the 19th century changed due to the same concepts. It is not perfect by any case. It's still a game that is meant to be enjoyable and entertaining. The game is not meant to be a commentary of the 19th century history, nor a documentary game for that. It does tell stories about the time period and embellishes it with game magic and storytelling to present to a gaming audience. And I think this game did it pretty well. The game is supposed to be played slowly, enjoying each and every step of the way while you expand your settlements and provide to your populations while learning new things along the way. May it be new mechanics, strategies, or new insights from playing the game. The DLC-based expansions might be questionable practice, yet the game can still be enjoyed in plain vanilla. There are mod support even if you want to spice up your gameplay. This game 
has earned a place in my heart and I will gladly tell anyone about this game and recommend it to them. Thank you for watching and see you on the next one.